Thank you very much. Um, I must remember to take out of my CV that I was a lawyer because I could just sort of <laughs> physically see people's shoulders drop when they heard that reference. Uh, I'm pleased to be here and uh, to give you some thoughts on the infrastructure sector and infrastructure in Australia over coming years and in particular given the work of Infrastructure Australia on developing the first 15 year plan for national infrastructure to make an invitation to this audience and to others that uh, when we get the opportunity for formal consultation uh, leading up to the plan, I will welcome your input. I will very much look to CEDA uh, as a body to advise us. The policy work that's been done by CEDA over the years has been of powerful influence and I hope on infrastructure and the services that come from infrastructure and the benefits that can come from it that CEDA will be at the forefront. Um, I'm also pleased to uh, talk in the context of my speech today about what Infrastructure Australia will be doing. The good news for us is that despite the Senate sometimes being a fascinating place, um, it passed with uh, all party support the legislation uh, to enhance and upgrade Infrastructure Australia recently. It took six months, but it was good that that legislation got through and as a result of that we've got all party backing for the new mandate for IA. Uh, and uh, the independence has been enhanced with the appointment of an independent board. We're currently um, moving to appoint the first chief executive of IA as well. And there's extra legislation now before the Senate, but we'll be following the path anyway of ensuring that we're doing uh, published cost-benefit studies of all the Commonwealth Government's investments over $100 million. In other words, every large infrastructure project in the country. We don't do defence, but I'm pleased to be saved from that, uh, and uh, we, we will have enough on uh, elsewhere. If I could just give a synopsis of, of uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, today and happy to answer questions on, it's that I think we need a very considerable period of good policy making and substantial reform, particularly in areas of infrastructure markets, if Australians are going to secure the real benefits that they seek from infrastructure today and tomorrow. But I think we should be optimistic that we can do that. There's been a considerable number of reforms. I think in this state it's probably the better performing of all states. But there's a lot to do if we want to win those real benefits. Um, I think I know many of the people in this room and I think you all would agree that infrastructure is fundamental to the national economy. It, underpins our social well-being as well as our economic well-being. And from a personal point of view, I also think it helps us define our national identity because our infrastructure aspirations are a reflection of our ambitions as a, as a country. The ideas that we put up and the ambition we have for large projects I think is often a measure of just how confident we are about what we can do over coming decades. So we should encourage the infrastructure debate, we should encourage the aspirations, and I believe in uncosted dreams, but costed projects, and we should have both. Um, and you shouldn't stop a dream of an idea for a project because it doesn't yet have full viability, but when you go towards doing the project, it should have established its viability. Of course, Australia is already regarded as one of the most sophisticated uh, markets for infrastructure. It's regarded as having one of the best uh, levels of experience of our construction sectors. And part of that is because the barriers to entry are quite low and the uh, keenness of Australian companies to have the best of overseas experience has been well established. Our engineering community reaches out for ideas and our companies tend to reach out similarly for those ideas. So I think Australia has got a high degree of sophistication and specialisation and therefore we've got the underpinnings of being able to take on more rather than feeling that there's some limit to our capacity. But I want to talk in this address about some of the growth issues we have to face, particularly population, some of the difficulties that we will face on delivering, which are around financing, and therefore focus on what should be the challenge for everyone in this room, just as it will be for Infrastructure Australia, 
that we have to take the dialogue that is occurring about infrastructure now to a higher level and we have to turn it into an actionable program of well articulated and well led reforms and policy changes. Ones that are going to see improvement in the services that infrastructure delivers and that's what it's all about, and ones that are going to make, make sure that we get better infrastructure projects delivered when they need to be delivered. And while I'm optimistic about uh, the outlook for infrastructure, I'm also realistic that there has to be some structural change or recognition of change that's already occurring before us. Since Federation, Australia's infrastructure has largely been run in the context of state assets, and state requirements. This is a legacy of a constitution which limited the federal government's infrastructure responsibilities to those few sectors that affected commerce between the states, or even in 1901 were regarded as transnational in nature. So in effect, the constitution left us with a legacy that Canberra had little role to play, and its actions were limited to telecommunications, aviation, and interstate freight. And whilst these neat divisions were often overridden by the practicalities of Commonwealth state financial arrangements, the role of the national tier of, of government is now one that it is the dominant source of funds for states, or in project in a sense, it is often the body that approves or disapproves of a project in terms of environmental or, or heritage approvals, for example. This has become clear in recent, year, and it's in recent years that the role of Canberra is more important and it's only been reinforced by the difficulty of state and territory budget settings. The states and the territories have less and they, they are therefore looking for other options. Canberra is sometimes one of them. But whilst Canberra has been a welcome source of budget allocations, it has not always, a, always had the inherent skills to choose the project recipients correctly, let alone has Canberra actually had the skills to deliver projects itself. And um, I welcome the earlier comments from our Auditor General's office um, and uh, their overview of projects. The same writ large could be said about Commonwealth delivered projects. This legacy therefore adds a rich complexity. Canberra is more important it will need to fund projects, but Canberra is less capable in picking and oversighting, let alone delivering them, than everyone in this room would like. So we've got to perform our role well as Infrastructure Australia, being inserted into that debate uh, to add a long-term plan, to add uh, oversight capacity, and to encourage quite open dialogue. If we don't, we're going to see infrastructure across the nation, which is what we look at, um, depressing productivity and depriving us of quality of life outcomes that we would otherwise all want. And if you've got increasing population, you have to have improved infrastructure if you are going to maintain quality of life levels. And that should be what infrastructure is measured against. And let's not, not forget our collective experience over recent years, the last decade, about shortfalls in infrastructure the experience of transport networks failing to keep pace with demand, state-owned water and electricity utilities being unreliable or, unreli or unreasonably costly, hospital services confounded uh, by shortfalls of infrastructure or freight corridors that have been neglected. These observations are now so common, it's not surprisingly that there's, there's almost a consensus of, on the need for action and, and generally on the same direction for action. But there's one particularly compelling reason for us to act. If we get our infrastructure right, we will protect Australia's quality of life at a time of significant population growth. And if we don't, we will lose out the advantages of quality of life and productivity. So against this historic federal context, Infrastructure Australia has been given a mandate from the Prime Minister to advise on creating a 15-year plan for our national infrastructure, which will be updated every five years. Uh, we've been asked, and we are currently in the process, of doing an audit, which is a top-down way of, of measuring the current status quo on infrastructure. Uh, and during 2000, 
15, we'll be using this order to distill the longer term vision. We will welcome public input, we will welcome the informed views of bodies like your own. Our audit is being produced with close engagement with the states and the territories. Because despite what I said recently about Canberra being the new kid on the block and the largest one, the states and the territories will do the large body of procurement, I think, for decades ahead. You need them, therefore, to be real partners with all of us and sharing information about their experiences and their ideas. The 15-year plan will be the key output for Infrastructure Australia next year, and it forms the immediate focus of the agency. But what we have to ensure beyond that is that we also get the settings right for policy to make the infrastructure delivery uh, possible. And through it, we get the community to understand the task and the need for change. I particularly spent a lot of time in New South Wales on infrastructure issues, just explaining to them the benefits of infrastructure change and what you can achieve on projects that have already been done in this state. If you move outside here, you'll see a French company running Melbourne's trams as a private business. We regard that as the norm. It's still regarded as exotic in New South Wales. This is part of the infrastructure task. We have had significant reforms. We have to encourage reforms and debate. And then when we talk about them, I ask you to talk about them nationally. This is a dialogue we should all learn from the best practice of others and recognise that if you have change, you can actually radically improve infrastructure. And I give Yarra Trams as just one cameo example of how change led to something good. Our approach to the National Infrastructure Plan will be driven by a very positive belief that the national gap on infrastructure can be filled. We're going to be seeking infrastructure that does three things. Firstly, it strengthens Australia's role as a globally focused economy, helping us export value-added products, services and resources. Secondly, it allows Australia to meet the needs, its needs as a highly urbanised nation, enhancing the livability of our cities, fostering the skilled jobs and the innovative businesses that our cities create. And thirdly, we want to underpin Australia's prospects for sustainable growth utilising the best of new technology and ensuring integrated land use decisions. In what context are we doing this? The principal context I want to discuss today is that of population and the reality of population growth. You can pick from many of the projections, the ABS is the best, but you can pick from many of the projections of, of population growth in Australia but what they largely tell us is Australia has now got about 23 million uh, citizens and in 50 years time we'll have about 46 million. In 50 years time we'll have doubled our population. Uh, these are not uh, sort of wishful or, or um, uh, policy based projections, they're really projections of population growth and average immigration levels we will have doubled our population. And not only that, we will have doubled our population, but we would have tripled the number of people who are over 65 years of age. So a fast growing population, also with a heavily ageing uh, population. The cities will be different. Australia will be all about Melbourne, Sydney, Perth and Brisbane. That's it if you believe in the projections. Melbourne and Sydney will have a population of about 8 million each. Perth will be larger than Brisbane, significantly larger than Brisbane. The population of the ACT will be significantly larger than the population of Tasmania. We are seeing a projection occurring in those, these cities that should energise and focus all of us. And when people say, what's infrastructure about? To me, infrastructure, a lot of it, is about dealing with the reality that this is a growing country with a growing population base. Compared to many other nations, it's a nice problem to have, but it's a real issue in front of us. And as we do this work, we need to focus on, okay, what should be in the 15-year plan that helps us deliver 
on these great cities operating more effectively and efficiently and us maintaining the quality of life. Uh, as I said, that's what it's all about. So it's population that drives it. I think one of the great breaks and the other one I want to mention, the other matter I want to mention is that of funding or finance of infrastructure projects. And Infrastructure Australia will seek to provide wise answers on fresh options that are available on the funding of infrastructure and what can be afforded as a nation. We certainly need to expand the total funding base for new infrastructure. We need to create effective new market mechanisms that, that signal where infrastructure should go and we want to ensure that we have sustainable capital investment. The current debate about funding sources and privatisation should therefore be encouraged. Recycling capital from one asset into another is a way of adding to the total capital stock and it's a way of op opening up a new funding opportunity for the infrastructure that you want to build in the 21st century. Selling or leasing old assets like ports and energy facilities allows the proceeds to be immediately deployed into new projects like public transport systems or freight networks. That's what New South Wales is doing now. Victoria privatised its electricity and used the proceeds to pay down debt and therefore free up effectively a budget environment to invest in new infrastructure. Handled well the multiplier effects of shifting capital out of an old asset into a new one will be considerable and long lasting. All of us should engage on that debate, educate people who have doubts about recycling capital and introducing them to the fact that if we do this, we can get a better outcome from their, for them, their family, their community, their business. If we don't do that, we're really saying we're going to rely on the old sources of funding. And I've got to tell you, the old sources of funding are not going to be enough for a population that doubles, and particularly an ageing population that needs to be cared for. We've got to ensure that we stress the consumer benefits that come from it. We've got to ensure that individuals are consulted and can see the future themselves. So the discussion about infrastructure reforms has to be personal as well as broader. So let me conclude with a few thoughts. This idea of having a 15-year plan I think is, is extremely timely. Australia is ready for this and I believe that we can get a consensus outcome on that 15-year plan. It's a good period, 15 years. It's not the out years of any state or federal budget. It's beyond that. You'll get a more open dialogue, therefore. You've got to have uh, quite fresh ideas about what could be done in 10 years beyond the budget settings and encourage people to do it. But there'll be other opportunities for us too. There's a number of reviews going on. The Federation White Paper, Ian Harper's current review of national competition policies, the committed reviews of the federal government on the tax system. These will all feed together because at the heart of that is looking at fresh ways of delivering uh, the outcomes that a community wants and looking at the tax base, looking at pricing systems, um, also looking at rigidities uh, that might exist between a state and a federal tier of government. I welcome all of that. I hope IA can also change Canberra. You might mark me down as being monumentally naive for that statement, but I hope that we can change the way that Canberra prioritises and, and Canberra plans infrastructure, and I believe that there's a real opportunity to do so. Indeed, our most transformative work will be in advising uh, federal departments on how a smart, well-motivated national government can use its capital investment priorities and its powers to leave a lasting legacy of major project delivery. I hope you can be as optimistic and idealistic as you can imagine in putting forward ideas, and they're ones that go well beyond the geographic boundaries of this state. If you accept my uh, assertion that Australia's population will, will double in the next 50 years, Probably the largest city at that time will be Melbourne, or at least it'll probably be eight million along with Sydney, and that Perth will be the third largest city and then Brisbane, and then a big stretch to the rest. Then we've got a slightly changing nation in terms of its look that we have to get our head around. We've got to do something that ensures that our grandchildren and their children enjoy the same quality of life as we enjoyed in our youth. And I think infrastructure is going to be at the heart of that. 
Our aim as Infrastructure Australia, I think, can be pulled down to one meaningful goal, to use infrastructure to help set Australia up for a higher standard of living. It's a goal well worth getting behind. Thanks very much.